Dave Aranda is mad. Why is Dave Aranda so mad? You are Locked On Baylor, your daily podcast on the Baylor Bears. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Woo, how about that new intro? I love it. Welcome to another episode of Locked On Bay. We're brought to you by LinkedIn. I am your host, Cam Stewart of ESPN Central Texas. Happy Monday to you. Hope you got your taxes in. Happy Patriots Day to you. And if you know anybody running in Hopkinton or Framingham or the hub of the universe today in the Boston Marathon, wish them good luck from me. Uh, anyway, big, big switch in the Baylor season here, the Baylor cycle. Thank you for making it your first listen today and every day and sticking with us through it all because last week was all basketball, kind of out of nowhere uh, with the Scott Drew and Kentucky rumors. And this week, we're now suddenly just five days away from the Baylor football spring game. And so we kind of need to, you know, get in our three-point stance and get back into football a little bit. Dave Aranda had some interesting comments over the weekend about why he is mad straight up angry these days and why fans might well like that. And Friday evening news dump, we had one of Scott Drew's favorite players ever declare for the NBA draft. We'll take a look at what that future might look like for him. And we are in baseball season. And while we sleep, Baylor baseball is making humongous strides, doing something they had not done in five years over the weekend. And it was bonkers. We're going to go over all of that as well. But like I mentioned, we are five days away from the Baylor football spring game at McLean Stadium. There's all kinds of storylines with new coaches here, with with a new quarterback here, and the quarterback battle that's going on. And How are they going to put together two competitive lines that they did not have last year, both on the offensive and defensive side? And new faces, new tactics, And one that remains the same is head coach Dave Aranda. To a lot of people's surprise, the the administration, the athletic department stuck with him for this 2024 season. How long he will last, that remains to be seen. But I will say, I've liked the pieces he's put into place in this offseason. But one thing I am still, most of that's on the offensive side of the ball. One thing I am still skeptical of is Dave Aranda taking over as the defensive coordinator, defensive play caller as well. Technically, um, technically they still have the same defensive coordinator in there, Matt Powledge, but it's Aranda that's calling the plays, sinking his teeth into it more, getting more hands on with the defense. Very successful defensive coordinator in the past. National championship defensive coordinator in the past. But it is interesting, I think, to see, you know, a guy who has struggled for the majority of his time as a head coach to try to go back to what he knows he's good at, being a defensive coordinator while also still trying to be the head coach. I'm cautiously, I'm, I'm cautious about it. Let's say that, you know, I'm not going to say he cannot do it because I do really value him as a defensive coordinator. Uh, I'm just intrigued to see what that looks like. And we know that part of the hiring with Jake Spavadol, and this is something they had said from the beginning, was they wanted an offensive coordinator with head coaching experience so that a little bit more can be taken off the plate, I think, of the head coach. And that's what you have gotten. And so just over the weekend, Eric Kelly of Fox 44 asked what it was like for Dave Aranda to get back into more of a hands-on defensive coaching role. And Dave had a very interesting, albeit not safe for some workplaces, answer to that question. I feel um, pissed off a whole lot more. I don't know if that's I'm supposed to say that, but I feel um, I get mad more than I normally would. And so um, I think the intensity of everything is way risen up. And I just think, you know, I think uh, to win games on defense, it's got to be fourth and one every day. And I think to try to, to be where that's the attitude, where it's fourth and one, um, and that you're bringing people together at the same time, uh, that's a, there's a trick to that. And so we're trying our best to, to work that trick, you know. But I, I know that everybody feels the urgency and the intensity, and it's got to start with us as coaches. 
Like most of us watching last year, Dave Aranda is pissed off. Better that than pissed on, I always say. Uh, I think this is a good thing, right? Or or is it? Because I just saw people all throughout the season last year, even in the games they would win, they'd be in the comment section of these videos, they'd be all over social media, uh, Facebook too, so that includes the the other generation that doesn't use Twitter. And it was all, no matter what the outcome, kind of upset with the head coach's personality and that he was very easy to shake things off, very cavalier about these things, used the Berenstein Bears and all that. And there were so many people, I think a legitimate portion of the fan base, that thinks you can't win with nice guys. You can't win with choir boys on the field. And you can't win with Boy Scouts telling them what to do off the field. And, or on the sideline, I should say, not off the field. You can, Let me rephrase that. You can't win with choir boys on the field. You can't win with Boy Scouts trying to tell them what to do on the sidelines. And Dave Aranda is now saying, this has awoken something in me. I'm not the Berenstein Bears guy anymore. I'm getting angry, and you won't like me when I'm angry. At least that's what we're hoping for. So is that enough? Is that enough for you guys? And this is a genuine question because I I didn't think the head coach did a good job last year. I also didn't really care about the attitude he brought into a press conference necessarily most of the time. Um, But it would be nice to see him a little more fired up. And one thing he did say is the intensity level has risen up as well, which is also a double-edged sword to hear as Baylor fans because it's something nobody would admit last year that there was just a very much a lack of energy on that sideline. And I can't help but think that trickled down from the head coach. Um, But it was, it was a, it was a problem. It, it seemed like there wasn't much of a compete factor to use a word that or a phrase that Dave likes to use a lot. I didn't see a lot of that out there. Um, and to actually acknowledge that there is a chip on the shoulder of this team and that they are getting better at, at themselves getting more pissed off, I think is a good step forward. I do. And right now it's all talk. I understand that. It's all talk right now. We're not going to, you know, it's not going to mean anything if we see it on display in the spring game. It's not going to mean anything until we see it on display against Utah, really. That's that's when it starts to mean something. Um, because until then, it's just, it's just kind of what we want to hear. But I'll say this, Dave Aranda has never been in the business of telling us what we want to hear. We can all talk about that from, from last year's experience. So I, that does lead me to believe, and again, maybe this is, naive, me being naive, there's something on this show like once or twice a week that I'm like, maybe I'm naive, but, and this is one of them, Dave Aranda tells it like he sees it. Not what we want to hear, not not getting himself into trouble most of the time. He, whether you think it's too vague or you think it doesn't make sense, he's telling it how he sees it. So when he says, I'm more pissed off out there, I do believe him in that. Say what you will. I do believe in him. I, you know, I, I think it could be warped from our standards, from what we see on the field, but I do think he believes that. And maybe that is what unlocks something in this team because we've heard from the recruits that they feel like they have a chip on their shoulder. I've heard from current players on the team. They feel like they have a chip on their shoulder. You know there's a coaching staff of guys who feel like they have a chip on their shoulder, and it starts with the guy at the top. And now he has admitted that that he comes in with more intensity. And I I think that's the way you got to do it. You know, treat every day like it's fourth and one. I, I hope they're better than that, than the, than the way they were on the field last year, both offensively and defensively on fourth and one. That's That'll be a, a good place to start, I would say. Today's episode is brought to you by LinkedIn Talent Solutions. Y'all, it is the best way to hire online. LinkedIn ain't like any other job board, okay? It helps you hire professionals that you can't find anywhere else, even those who aren't actively searching for a new job but might be open for the perfect role. 
We all have that. I have that. You have that. You know, we're not always looking, but if something comes up, oh, I would take that. Most college basketball coaches say that about Kentucky, not ours. So if you're looking on LinkedIn, you're looking in the wrong. If you aren't looking on LinkedIn, oh, you're looking in the wrong place because they are 86% of small businesses get a qualified candidate within 24 hours. You can hire professionals like a professional. They know that small businesses are wearing so many hats and might not have all the time or resources to hire. That's why they are constantly finding ways to make the process easier. Two and a half million small businesses use LinkedIn for hiring. So post your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked on college. That's linkedin.com slash locked on college. L-O-C-K-E-D-O-N-C-O-L-L-E-G-E to post your job for free. Terms and conditions do apply. We have to shift back over to basketball for just a little bit here. We got the news we wanted to hear late in the week last week. Scott Drew staying at Baylor. He announces that Thursday morning. In the midst of that, like that same day, Caleb Lohner announces he's entering the transfer portal. We already addressed that. But one guy we didn't know what the future held for was was Jonathan Chamwachachua. And we did find that out over the weekend. Friday night, uh, Everyday John, as he is affectionately known as, announced that he would be pursuing his dream and entering into the NBA draft. Uh, Scott Drew has called him one of his favorite players to ever don the Baylor uniform, and he is certainly a fan favorite. If you follow this channel, you'll know he's he's a, a, a favorite of mine, um, for sure, uh, both, both as a player and as a leader and as a representative for the university. So all three of those things, um, I very much uh, appreciate Jonathan Chamuchachu and what he's done for Baylor. and. This decision isn't much of a surprise that he's deciding to go into the NBA draft, but I also don't know much of what his stock is, but that's a a different thing. Because first, I think a lot of us thought this guy is going to play professional basketball, but where? You know, I I would have leaned and would still lean towards somewhere like Europe, uh, maybe the G League, and he has said, including telling my my broadcast partner Matt Mosley said nope nba i'm i'm shooting for the highest star i've come all this way why shoot for anything different nba and that's what he seems to be in for um and and he's an intriguing prospect to me because we all saw i mean if if, if this had happened even after the 2021 season where he was still you know in a small role um, still had a lot of growth left. I thought that would have been a guy with NBA, at least G League talent and stock for sure because of the way he played. And then we saw it, of course, for most of the 2022 season. He's that above-the-rim guy, ultra-athletic, but real good basketball sense on the defensive end, good timing on the defensive end, excellent rebounder as well as a shot blocker, um, great pick-and-roll guy, especially offensively. Uh, but that player we saw in early 2022 is not the Jonathan Chamuchachua that's playing today, at least that we've seen. Um, his role took a huge dip this past season to where there were there were several games where, where he didn't get any minutes at all. Um, he started the season as a starter in game one, and by game two or three, I don't think he was anymore, to the point, again, where towards the end of the season, there were entire games where we weren't we weren't seeing him trot out there. And, and a lot of that is the difference in the lateral quickness after the knee injury, which is of course, completely understandable. He's just, he's never had the same um, burst again that we've seen since that, since that knee injury. And I, I know Jonathan is probably sick of hearing about that. You know, he doesn't want to be known as the walking miracle. He wanted to be, player in the NBA, which is what he was on the fast track of becoming until this knee injury. But this di- this does change a lot of things. Um, I don't, again, don't know that he has the explosiveness, the lateral quickness to defend at the same level that he did when he was the Big 12 Defensive Player of the Year in 2022. Um, I think that's a, that's a big, big difference. And I wonder what his role is like in the NBA where, you know, the athletes are better. Um, 
it's more of a grind of a season. Obviously, it's you know 82 games. Uh, the game is pretty spaced out, which I think works for him because he's also a guy who, I guess, blessed through the injury, uh, focused on his jump shot a lot and became an effective jump shooter. Uh, you know, not a guy who's like taking you off the dribble step back, but a decent spot up shooter, even from three. Um, that was something he was really useful with towards the end of the 2023 season when he came back from that injury. Um, and I wonder if that does play into this a little bit. I mean, if if he's at 60 or 70% of the health that he was um, in 2022, he's still a pretty darn good athlete and can shoot it from the outside. And, and maybe that earns him a chance. But I, I have not seen his name on, on the mock drafts that were updated this weekend. Um, didn't see much buzz around it before. I, I'm really pulling for him. I am really pulling for him. I, I see him as a professional basketball player. I do. I, I don't know if it's going to be in the NBA, but that is his goal. That's what he has announced. And I sincerely hope for him that that is the case. Um, well, we'll just, we'll have to wait and see. We'll certainly be rooting him on every step of the way. That is something we will we'll need to go over later this week. Who is just, who is coming back? for this team next year. There's there's rumors. There's still a couple of guys who have not declared for the draft, but it's I think it's time to take a pulse on that uh, sometime later this week. Uh, another name, speaking of basketball, that was mentioned in the transfer portal, one guy that they, that they have reached out to, I talked about uh, Jared Coleman-Jones of Middle Tennessee last week, but back to the guard position, Jordan Pope is someone they have reached out to. He is at Oregon State or is leaving Oregon State as we bring this and he is a guy who's intriguing, but I don't know if he's an exact fit for this team. He's a talented player for sure. Uh, averaged over 18 points a game in the Pac-12 and shot 45% from the field, 37% from three, which isn't off the charts. Um, he had his best game of the season and probably their biggest game. They beat Arizona and he had 31 points in that game um, and is a, a truly, really efficient offensive player. Uh, 10th and offensive box plus minus in, in the big 12. He had actually, or excuse me, the pack 12, um, the late pack 12 and had the most minutes in the conference as well. So that's a guy who is, is used to playing a lot, um, can get to the rim, uh, similar to the way Ray J well, similar to the fact that Ray J Dennis could get to the rim as, as a guard, but this guy's more of a combo guard. Whereas Ray J is, is a pure point guard. So different ways to do it, but he can get to the rim and a 23% assist rate, I'll take that. That's that's pretty good. Um, I, I like that, as a matter of fact. But uh, he he has not limited it yet, but he has, or reports have come out that he is taking two visits to Texas this week, and Baylor has not been listed on there yet. He's going to be visiting UT and a and so maybe he's a big SEC guy. Coming down to SEC country. Uh, but that's just one that I, I want to keep track of because I, I'm interested to see if he sneaks in a, a Baylor visit in there as well, now that Scott Drew has announced that he is coming back to the team. Uh, but I say that he might not be exactly the fit for Baylor because th there's nothing that I've been able to see in my research to show that he's like a top-end defender um, or really a pretty good defender for that matter. Uh, we have not seen that yet. I know that's something that Scott Drew's teams have it's not been a prerequisite for their point guards. Uh, James Akinjo was not much of a defender. Ray J. Dennis was an okay defender. Keontae George was an okay defender at best. You know, it, it's not something that th they really focus on the two guard, obviously, to have that. You haven't had a real shutdown defensive point guard since Davion Mitchell, uh, which that guy is uh, is a unicorn in some ways. I uh, wish we had him, man. But I, I do think it's interesting to to see how Baylor evaluates the guard position with obviously Rob Wright coming in as a, a top end point guard, VJ Edgecombe coming in who looks to be just a shooting guard. Not that that's a bad thing, uh, but I, I just wonder how they treat point guard in this transfer portal. It's something I'm going to bring up a lot as we look through names. I think you can never have enough point guards, especially if you're Baylor, especially when you've looked at it the last couple of years where you have not had enough since the national championship team. When Jared Butler was a more than capable backup point guard, you have not had a backup point guard since Adam Flagler. Good enough. 
and a terrific player, terrific scorer, just clearly a shooting guard, not, not a point guard. Um, like I said, love, fine, but not one you can really trust with five or six straight minutes of running an offense. Um, he's a shooting guard. He's a good player, but he's a shooting guard. And I just wonder if if Baylor really attacks the, the portal hard, even, even with Rob Wright coming in again as one of the best point guards in the country. If you're Baylor at this point, I, I just don't think you can have enough in, in the way of of point guards seeing what's happened to you over over the last couple of years. Cause I think that is a, a reason why they have not been able to compete really at the top end of the, of the big 12 for, for the conference championship, I should say uh, they're definitely in that upper tier, but not conference championship and why they've gone out in the round of 32 for the last three years as well. And today's episode of Locked on Baylor is also brought to you by FanDuel. Best sports time of the year, okay? We are like days away from the playoffs in the NBA and the NHL. Baseball is in full swing. That guy won the Masters yesterday. I'm a huge golf guy, so I know. Uh, and FanDuel is your place to bet on every game. Right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets guaranteed. That's 150 bucks, win or lose. Bet on everything from slap shots to home runs to slam dunks, all on an app that is safe, secure, and easy to use. So what are you waiting for? Visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and make your first bet an automatic win. Again, that's FanDuel.com slash locked on. L-O-C-K-E-D-O-N. FanDuel. America's number one sports book. The big Baylor story of the weekend, at least on the field, is something we have not seen since I was in college. That's a long time ago. The Bears with a crazy win on Saturday at Miller Park, not in Milwaukee, but in Provo, Utah, 18 to 17 over the Cougars to sweep BYU. Now, that is significant for a couple of reasons. First off, that scoreline, which I'll get into in a minute, is nuts. But how about this stat? By the way, all of these come from Max Calderon, good friend and, and Baylor baseball SID. He was also in college the last time this happened. It is the first sweep of a Big 12 series, a road series, or a road Big 12 series since 2019. When they did it to TCU. Remember that? They they beat TCU like eight straight games, man. They swept them up in Fort Worth. Those were the days. They swept them the year before and beat them in the conference tournament the year before as well. So it, it has been a long time since they did any of those things. And that really puts into perspective how much of an uphill battle this has been the last couple of years, even, even the last two years of the Steve Rodriguez era. Um, I know 2020 was almost wiped out. I, I mean, you basically didn't have a conference season that year, if I'm not mistaken. So um, it, it just shows kind of the decline that they, that they have been down um, coming into the season and to, to prove that incremental victories are very important for this team. And, this was an incremental victory, a moral victory, but also a real victory. They swept a Big 12 team on the road. And that is never a given in college baseball, even for the great teams, man. And this is just something to, to be a building block. This, this team got to go on the road in elevation, weird schedule, but they didn't use any of those excuses, nor should they. They went and they were the better team and they swept them. And that game Saturday was nuts. Baylor was up, bit, like opened the floodgates in like the third or fourth inning. And at one point you look up and they're up 18 to five. Do you remember? Let's dial it back. Do you remember what I said the final score was? 18 to 17. Whew. The starters have been terrific. This offense has been raking. The bullpen leaves a lot to be desired. And you've heard me on this show talk about how tough it is to rebuild in college baseball for a program like Baylor. There's really only a few programs in college baseball that can turn it around very quickly uh, with, with the power dynamic in this sport. You are seeing it on full display when the bullpen 
turns a 13 run lead into a one run lead and a Kobe Andrade save at the end. That that just goes to show that they've built two or three of the four phases. Their defense has been solid, um, but the, and they've had to shift guys around. The starting pitching has been good. The hitting has been very good at times. And the bullpen's not quite there yet. So that just goes to show how much goes into rebuilding a program like Baylor. It does not happen overnight. But these stats, oh, this is fun. I have not been able to say this for a long time. Um, and honestly, seeing the Davis Wenzel uh, debut last week, and I did that segment, it it kind of got me nostalgic for the days of when I was in college of Baylor baseball, 2018 and 17, 18, and 19, uh, really. But I, I was just like, man, we were so close. We're so close. 18 was so talented, won the Big 12 tournament. Uh, 19 was an Omaha team, Omaha roster before the injuries settled in. Um, and it it just felt like we were that close and then to last year being so far away. But they are building in that direction again. They've now won five of the last seven weekend series. Wow. Uh, and that game Saturday was the seventh double-digit hit output in the last eight games. These guys can rake, man. They really can. Enzo Apodaca, specifically, on Saturday, five for five. First Bayor guy to have a five-hit performance in two years. Two years. Think about that. Think of the, some of the, the competition you play in the middle of the week when you're scoring 25 runs. And none of them had a five-hit game in two years. Wow. And because of that, the Bears have skyrocketed up to fifth in the Big 12 Conference. How about that? Ahead of Texas Tech, of course, because they took the series against them, and quite a bit ahead of TCU, who continues to struggle in this conference. And the Bears get back at home this next weekend with another winnable series as they take on Kansas over the weekend. Like this, this momentum, it might not stop just yet. Kansas is sub 500 in the Big 12. By the way, Baylor is over 500 in the Big 12. They're 16 and 18 overall, so they still need to work up to get, get above that 500 mark overall. But 8 and 7 in the Big 12, man. I have not been able to say that for years after the first weekend of conference play. They're above 500. And I, I, I understand the Big 12 this year isn't what it was even you know, three or four years ago, you know, uh, TCU is inexplicably down. Uh, tech is struggling. Uh, UT is struggling to find its footing. In fact, West Virginia is the top team in the conference right now. Uh, and at 21 and 13 overall. So, and, and, you know, tech 26 and 10 overall, but eight of those 10 losses in the big 12, whereas Baylor is starting to play better baseball as they get into the big 12 schedule. And, it's not like they haven't faced the big boys yet. They faced Tech and took two out of three. Um, it is, you know, a bit of smooth sailing, or at least it should be, for Cincinnati, BYU, and Kansas. I I, I get that. Uh, but this league is kind of up for grabs as we speak. I'm not saying Baylor's going to win it, because I doubt that. <laughs> I'm just worried about getting into the conference tournament. But it is kind of up for grabs in this league, and, and Baylor is showing that they are turning a corner. And I, I love seeing that as a baseball fan and a Baylor fan and as someone who opines for the days of yore of 2018, 2019, which wasn't even as good as what it was 15, 20 years ago when they were making super regionals. Anyway, let's get back to that, shall we? Uh, let me know what you think about Baylor baseball down in the comments below. Uh, how you feel about new, angry, mad Dave Aranda. Please, please get involved with that in the comments below. Do you believe it? Or is it, is it going to help out the team? If it is true, please drop that down below. And where you see everyday John going in his basketball career, whether it's the NBA or Europe or on the bench somewhere, I'm, I'm more than, more than, uh, he's more than capable of doing any one of those things, I guess I should say. Um, drop that down in the comments below. Thank you for making it your first listen today and every day. We're right here on YouTube, so be sure to like and subscribe. Drop a comment. Tell your friends. Hit the ring notification bell there for whenever we upload a new video. It's every day, 7 a.m. Central Time, uh, and wherever you get your podcasts as well. We'll be back tomorrow with your favorite show. Of course, that is Locked On Baylor. <laughs>